Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining this edition of the TechBio APEC webinar, uh, focusing on the topic of smart sequencing applications for human genetics and medicine. Dr. Adam Amura. And Adam uh, is an associate professor and senior bioinformatician in the SciLab Lab National Genomic Infrastructure in Sweden. He's also an adjunct researcher at Monash Nash University in Australia. And his uh, research interest, interest uh, primarily focused on technology development and novel sequencing applications for the study of human health and disease. And uh, some of the ongoing activities uh, included the uh, in construction of a whole genome reference data set for genetic variation in the Swedish population, as well as introduction of a long range single molecule sequencing technology into the clinical routine. With that, I would like to uh, hand it over to Adam. Go ahead, Adam. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. I hope everyone can see my uh, my presentation and my screen. So today I'm going to talk about work that we are doing uh, when it comes to uh, to use uh, PacBio smart sequencing uh, for human genomics and medicine. Uh, and the place where I work is at the uh, at the National Genomics Infrastructure in Sweden. Uh, so we are basically a core facility for for Swedish researchers. So people can come with their projects and uh, and secret sequence at our place uh, and we uh, perform uh, sequencing and also some bioinformatics analyses and during last year we processed about 1000 samples uh, or 34000 samples and 1000 projects so it's a quite big operation and we are located both in in the capital uh, stockholm and also we have a facility in uppsala which is quite close to stockholm and uppsala is the place where i work uh, and we have all types of instruments at our facility, uh, but uh, one thing that I have been working on for a long time is, uh, is the PacBio sequencing. Uh, so we received our first instrument back in 2013, and to the left you can see that it was kind of a big instrument to get into the lab. Uh, it, it was the RS2 instrument uh, at that point in time that was state of the art. Uh, but then more recently we have also acquired new uh, machines and last year we installed the SQL 2 instrument which is PacBio's latest and greatest piece of equipment. Uh, and we just one slide here showing uh, the benefits of PacBio sequencing for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, and the thing with PacBio sequencing is that we can get long reads that have very high accuracy uh, which is something that is quite unique for this platform. Uh, and the way this works is that we start from a double-stranded DNA molecule. So this could be several kilobases in length or tens of kilobases even. Uh, we then ligate smart belt adapters, which are these blue uh, things here to the left, oops, in the figure. Uh, you then anneal primers and bind a polymerase in one of these adapters. Uh, this whole molecule then goes into a well on, on, a, on a chip and then you perform sequencing. And when you're doing the sequencing, the polymer starts to move around this molecule. So that's displayed to the right in this figure. Uh, and when you're doing that, you will create several passes of this molecule. Uh, and each pass is, is called the sub-read. So you will see that both these, this yellow and this uh, more pink line, they get sequenced many times. Uh, and each pass of the molecule has quite a lot of errors, but you can then combine all of these subreads into a high quality read for this specific molecule. And this is something that is called the hi fi read. And only with four passes, we can reach 99% accuracy. Uh, so this is quite unique then that you can get from single molecules, get these very high quality reads of several uh, kilobases in length. Uh, and what are we then using this type of sequencing for? Well, we are doing it for many different purposes. As I said, we are a core facility, so we are not only doing sequencing on human applications. So this slide just shows a bunch of different applications that we are doing. Uh, but then uh, I will also focus more on sort of the human medical applications, which is my expertise. We're also a certified service provider for this type of sequencing. So we can take on uh, samples also from abroad. 
this is just showing that highlighting that we are doing things that are non-human so we are part of the something that is called the earth biogenome project which is a really massive uh, initiative to try to uh, sequence more or less all species uh, on earth and it's a very long-term project of course but SciLife lab is one of the partners in this um, uh, in this project and PecBio is one of the main technologies that we're doing using for for assembling high quality genomes for these different species uh, but as i said the topic of today is more uh, focused on medicine and how to to perhaps even bring this type of, of sequencing into the clinic uh, and you can ask yourself why we want to use this technology for medical applications uh, I was involved in writing a, a review article on this that was published last year and there are some key advantages of this long read single molecule sequencing and one is obvious that we can get longer read length so we can sequence uh, stretches of DNA that is not possible to read with other technologies. Uh, we can also look at uh, base modifications since we're not doing any amplification and sequencing uh, native DNA molecules, we can uh, try to search for methylation and those kind of things also in this data. Uh, and with PEC bio-sequencing, we also have this uh, unique feature that we get very high accuracy reads, as I explained uh, just previously. Uh, and when we are thinking of using uh, smart sequencing in the clinic, uh, we can do it in many different ways. And usually what we are trying to do is perhaps to look at very targeted regions. You're interested in a, perhaps in a cancer gene or another locus uh, that is of clinical relevance. Uh, and I would say that one of the most efficient ways to do uh, PAC bio-sequencing is to simply uh, first uh, create an amplicon using long range PCR and then to sequence this molecule. Because then you can get very high accuracy sequencing from uh, from a single amplicon and this can be used for detection of mutations and you can also face these different mutations and we have done this in several different projects uh, so they are listed here on this slide so we are one of my favorites project is that we're using this for screening of bcr able cancer mutations in leukemia uh, and this is actually something that we also have implemented now in clinical routine so we're just you know doing a deep sequencing of this specific gene in, in patients uh, we're also having similar projects in other types of diseases as uh, like the hepatitis c we're also looking at the tp53 gene uh, and also other uh, locus that are important for different types of disease so with this slide i would just like to highlight if, if long-range pcr works for your project and, and gets the information that you you want then you shouldn't try to do anything more more fancy and i will talk about more fancy approaches right now so but, but if, if long-range PCR works, then this is not something for you. But if PCR doesn't work uh, well, wh when, when you're looking at regions that are perhaps very repetitive or uh, other things that are different to amplify using PCR, then you might need other approaches to look specifically at those regions. Uh, and we have been involved in a project uh, that started as a collaboration with, with PacBio uh, to try to use the CRISPR-Cas9 system to study these types of regions. Uh, and the way this, uh, uh, this method works is that we start from these, these molecules, as I described before. So these are the smart cell molecules that are sequenced on PacBio. Uh, you then have a region of interest. In this case, uh, it's displayed by these blue lines. So this could be perhaps a repeat region that is interesting to study or some other uh, region of the genome that is difficult to amplify. Uh, what you then do is to design a guide RNA uh, flanking this region. So this is the, uh, the red line here, the vertical line, uh, and you can then use this guide RNA to, to then uh, get the Cas9 to bind there and to cut these molecules. Uh, so uh, this here shows that the molecule has been cut by, by uh, the Cas9. What you then do is to ligate adapters that are different from these orange ones so these adapters are instead green uh, and then you can use the sequences in these adapters to capture them by a magnetic bead and in that way get enrichment of those molecules that has contains this target of interest 
Uh, and finally, you can then perform sequencing on, on a PacBio instrument. Uh, and as you see here, there is no PCR involved in this whole process. Uh, we tried this approach for studying repeat elements in the HTT gene. Uh, and the HTT gene is causative for Huntington's disease, and it contains a CAG uh, repeat that can be expanded. And if you have too many of these uh, repeat expansions or repeats, um, then you will uh, 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 develop this uh, disease. Uh, so we looked at, uh, at the HTT gene in 12 uh, Huntington disease patient samples. And a nice thing with this assay is that we can actually multiplex. So we can study several guide RNAs in the same run. So instead of only having HTT, we also included a few other ones like the ATXN10 and FMR1 uh, that are also known to be causative of different diseases. So we can create a panel of these types of guide RNAs. Uh, and at the bottom here, you can see the results for one of the patients. So on the y-axis here, you have the number of reads that we get for the different targets, and the different targets are now colored with, uh, with these lines. So you can see that the most amount of reads is in the HTT region. And we can then look closer into this region in different patient samples. So to the left, you have a patient A here that has two different alleles, where we have the CAG repeat count 21 on, on one of the alleles and 36 on, on the other allele. So it has one uh, expanded allele. Uh, for, for sample B or patient B here, we have uh, one allele with 15 repeats, and the other one is uh, is expanded and has somewhere around 54 to 57 perhaps repeats. And what's interesting with this technology is that we can uh, we can determine that these different repeat counts are due to somatic variation in this uh, sample. Uh, because we don't use any PCR, so it could, couldn't be something to do with, uh, uh, with a PCR stutter or anything like that, but rather we think that it's due to this patient having different uh, copy numbers of this repeat in different cells of the blood. Uh, so why do we think that this is a good approach? Uh, well, of course, it, it has the advantage of not using any PCR, and we can do multiplexing of uh, many different targets, as I said. Uh, we can also do multiplexing of several samples in a run. And it allows us to sequence through these difficult regions. And something that we haven't investigated, but it's possible to do, is to also to study epigenetic modifications in these regions, uh, since, since we now are sequencing native DNA. Uh, there are a few disadvantages. So we require quite a lot of input DNA. Uh, and also the, the protocol, uh, has been quite difficult to, to use, so it took, took quite a lot of time and it was quite com complex. Uh, but one thing I should mention here is that I know that there is a new version of this protocol out, and we have been testing that one, uh, and it has improved quite a lot on many of these different fronts. So uh, I think if you're interested in this, these types of targets, then it's definitely an approach that, that could be uh, something for you to try. Uh, yes, and for those of you who were uh, Looking very closely at this figure, maybe you noticed already that there are also a few targets here uh, that we didn't want to enrich, but where we have peaks. And something that we can, uh, can see here is that uh, we can find places where these guide RNAs are binding the genome that is not at the actual target. So these are off-targets uh, hits for these different guide RNAs. Uh, and this is something that I will uh, come back to a bit later in this talk, uh, because uh, we have uh, a whole project uh, looking into these off-targets for these different guide RNAs. Uh, but first, I would just like to sort of mention some work that we are doing also when it comes to, to sequencing whole human genomes, because right now I've been talking about looking at specific regions of the human genomes, but we are also uh, involved in sequencing uh, uh, entire genomes. Uh, and one project that I've been working on uh, for a long time is uh, something called the SWEGEN project, where we have established a database with information, uh, genetic information from 1,000 uh, Swedish individuals. And these uh, individuals have been sequenced uh, using short read technologies uh, with the, uh, 30x, I think, whole genome sequencing. 
Uh, and you can see here to the left sort of just how the genetic variation is different in, in Sweden and other places in Europe. Um, and there's also kind of an interesting pattern where northern Sweden is, is kind of different to the southern and central parts of Sweden. Uh, and so we have all this information from short read genomes. Uh, but what we've also doing, been done, doing in this project is to take two of these individuals from different parts of this cluster, and one male and one female, uh, and we have uh, sequenced this, these individuals with different types of technologies. Uh, with the aim to create reference, new reference genomes for these individuals. Uh, and we, we can both create these reference genomes, but we can also look at structural variation. I will not go into this very much, but, but we, we find a lot of structural variations in, in these genomes compared to the, uh, as compared uh, to what we find with short read sequencing. Uh, but what we've also been doing then is to de novo assemble the de, de novo assembly of these reference genomes we're using the PAC biodata. And we had 75x of PAC biodata. This was from the old RS2 days. Uh, and we could then perform an assembly of this using the Falcon tool and also do error corrections of these reads. At this point in time, it took three weeks just to analyze one of these genomes on our big supercomputer. Uh, but nowadays it's much faster. I will come back to that a bit later. Um, but anyway, you can see the statistics that we got from this assembly of these two individuals. So we were able to assemble uh, three gigabases, both for individual one and two, and we could assemble these into about 11,000 contigs for each of the individuals. Uh, so these statistics are very good, I would say. So these are among the most uh, uh, successful assembly so far using PEC biodata. Uh, and what we have been doing then is to, to try to look at these uh, contexts, these sequences that we have assembled and compare them to the existing human reference. Uh, and what we could see is that more than 99% of the bases can be aligned to the human reference. Uh, you can see here in this figure how our context compared to the reference, so you have the different chromosomes. The blue lines here correspond to context from individual one and the red ones from individual two. Uh, so you can see that we cover basically the whole genome and we also have coverage on the Y chromosome for individual one. So this is the male individual. Uh, but as you can, as I said before, we had more than 99% of the bases were aligning to the human reference, but this means that there also is still a fraction of bases that it is not aligning to the to the existing human reference. And we, when we look into this a bit closer, we can see that uh, 14 megabases for from individual one is not aligning to to HG38, and for individual two, we have 10 megabases of this novel sequence. Uh, what we did then was also to compare this to a Chinese genome that was published in 2016. And we can see that six megabases of this sequence is overlapping in all of these three different genomes. Uh, so since these are now overlapping uh, pieces between individuals that have been sequenced in different labs and are also from different parts of the world, we don't think that there's something to do with contamination or anything like that, but rather it's probably likely to be missing sequence from the, from the existing reference genome. Uh, and quite a lot of it is six megabases. Uh, what we did then was to look closer into this, these sequences and perform the blast of all our novel sequences to the NCBI database. Uh, what we could see that 62% uh, of all these sequences that are novel are in fact have some kind of human hit. Uh, mainly these are back clones that perhaps were Sanger sequenced uh, well a long time ago when they were building the initial human reference, but they haven't been placed in uh, HD38. We also have no hits, so these are sequences that are, were not existing at the database, at least not uh, at the point in time when we performed this analysis. 6% uh, of these novel sequences match to non-human primates, so these are maybe uh, regions that have been sequenced in chimpanzees or other uh, primates, but not in, in humans. Uh, and then we have a very small class of, uh, of sequences here uh, but 
that is also kind of interesting. I think it's less than 1% uh, where we find other things. Uh, and some of the other things is, for example, a complete HPV35 genome in one of the individuals. Uh, so it must have been an individual that is infected by this virus. Uh, and also something that was very strange was that we found some parasite worm sequences. Uh, and I will show these worms on the next slide. Maybe you want to look away because these uh, worms are kind of disgusting. Uh, so these are examples of the worms that we found in the two Swedish genomes and in the Chinese. Uh, and this is not something that you would expect sort of a normal healthy individual to go around and, and carry the DNA of these individuals. So uh, we really had to think carefully about how this could happen. Uh, and when you go back to the initial uh, studies where the worm sequences were, uh, were produced, uh, the way that it's been done is that you take the tissue uh, or the worm from, from a poor individual that is infected by this, uh, then you do a library preparation of this, maybe you get some human DNA also, you could uh, imagine when you do the library prep into this, like human contamination. Uh, and then you do library preparation sequencing uh, with short reads, and then you assemble this. And what they then did was to map the context that it got to the existing human reference. Uh, and then they said that the rest of it was worm. But I mean, if what has happened here is probably that you have uh, a part of this sequence uh, that, that, is, that is missing from the genome, then you may uh, classify this uh, wrongly. I mean, if, if, if the human uh, reference that you're using is actually contains sequences that is missing. Uh, so maybe, or at least that, that's our hypothesis now, is that these sequences are erroneously annotated as worm DNA, but it's, in fact it is human DNA, but it's just been uh, classified wrong because of this type of contamination. Uh, yes, uh, we can also look closer into where these novel sequences are located. We can see that they are mainly mapping to centromeres or telomeres, uh, which is perhaps not that uh, unexpected, and also they are quite repetitive and CG rich. So these are sequences that have been difficult to sequence before. Uh, what we also have been doing is to try to see what kind of benefit uh, these sequences can be of when we try to build more uh, a population specific reference for the Swedish population. Uh, so what we have done here is an experiment where we start from the short read data, the Illumina data that we have for all the Swedish individuals, but then align this data as normal to the HG38, but then we have also built a new reference sequence where we've added the Swedish context to the existing uh, human reference, and then we compare the results uh, between these two uh, types of analyses. Uh, and there are a few interesting things that uh, come out here. Uh, so this slide shows one example where we can clean up some ugly regions of the genome in this way. So this is actually on chromosome 17. Uh, and we see here Illumina reads that are, is mapped to this region. At the top, it's, uh, it's Illumina reads mapped to the normal reference. Uh, but at the bottom, it's Illumina reads, the same reads mapped to the same reference, but we also added these novel sequences. Uh, so, and these novel sequences are now some other place in the genome. But as you can see here at the bottom, we have a much cleaner picture as compared to the top. And the reason for this is probably that many of the reads uh, at the top uh, in this region, they are actually from these novel sequences and, and are forced to align in this place here. And it gives rise to a lot of false positive SNPs. Uh, but uh, as you can see here at the bottom, then it's all cleaned up. So uh, it makes the analysis of this region uh, much better. And we have other examples of this. This is one example also in the protein coding gene, where you have the same thing, where the uh, normal alignment is kind of ugly, but when we align it to our new reference, uh, then it looks much cleaner. Uh, and if you're interested, we uh, this has all been published, and you can look at this paper and uh, we have also other analyses that we have done in this project. Okay, but now uh, I would like to finally jump back to the thing that I was starting to talk, talk about earlier, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing and, uh, and the, the off-targets that we are trying to investigate. Uh, and as you all know, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is, is an uh, amazing tool uh, for editing genomes and it's used in many different areas of life sciences. 
Uh, but one thing that has been talked about quite a lot when it comes to CRISPR-Cas9 is, is these off-target effects. And there's a debate whether we should worry about these or not. Uh, so there are a few papers that have shown that uh, there are many uh, off-targets or sort of places where and where we get mutations where we shouldn't shouldn't or didn't expect to find mutations. Uh, but then uh, there are also a bunch of papers claiming that uh, the off-targets are not really a big issue, at least not when looking into uh, living cells or in vivo experiments. Uh, so we want to investigate this in an unbiased manner. Uh, and the, the way that people are usually predicting these off-target sites uh, right now is by doing a sequence comparison. So basically what you do then is to take uh, the sequence of a guide RNA and you map it to the genome and see where it is supposed to bind. Uh, and then you predict that sort of these places uh, could give rise to of targets. Uh, and this could be a good approach of doing it. It's a simple way, but it, what you do need is a reference genome. And one problem here is that the reference genome that you're using, it might be uh, different compared to the cells that you're studying. Um, and there are also other methods where we can try to do this using experimental approaches, uh, but these all methods are all based on short read sequencing uh, and also has PCR in the, in the library preparation. Uh, this slide is just to illustrate again how the guide RNA uh, is binding to, to, for example, a human genome. So, uh, this is at the top, you can see here the reference genome, and you perhaps expect a guide RNA to bind at a certain location because it's the perfect match there. But if you look into a specific individual, you might have uh, polymorphisms. So these are the red lines here that are base changes. And maybe this could uh, mean that the guide RNA is no longer binding to this off-target site, but it could bind to some other place uh, that has now uh, more homology to the to the guide RNA. Uh, and one thing we can ask ourselves is if we can really study these uh, off-target sites in a good way if we don't know the, the exact genome of, of the individual that we're studying. Uh, so we have tried to look in at, to all of these things in a, and we have a preprint out on, on this uh, uh, on this study uh, where we have used amplification-free long read sequencing approaches. To, to study CRISPR-Cas9 of targets. And here I want to highlight Ida Hoyer, who is uh, a PhD student who has been doing uh, most of this work on developing uh, these tools. Uh, yes, so what we are doing here is uh, something called smart off-target sequencing. And this is a, a something that is very similar to the approach that I showed before. So it's like a continuation of that project. Uh, and it's an amplification-free protocol for detection of the CRISPR-Cas9 of targets. Uh, once again, we can also do multiplexing of several guide RNAs uh, in one single run. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's adapted from this uh, NOAMP protocol. Uh, the only major difference is that we are starting off from DNA that has been uh, randomly fragmented instead of using uh, um, restriction enzymes, which is used in the NOAMP protocol. Uh, so you can see there that we have the smart belts and then we digest these uh, smart belts with the, with the Cas9, and then ligate adapters and then do the sequencing. I should also mention that we have developed an alternative approach for this, also using nanopore sequencing. Uh, so we can also compare between these two, two different approaches. Uh, we did experiments here in the in the HEC 293 cell line, which is a embryonic kidney cell line that was cultured way back in the 70s. Uh, and since we now want to know uh, exactly where the guide RNAs are binding, what we did was to perform uh, whole genome resequencing of this uh, cell line. And in this case, we use now the latest in PEC bio sequencing, so the the HiFi reads on SQL2. Uh, and we sequence this to 18x coverage. Uh, this image here shows uh, how some of these reads are mapping to the to the genome. And this is a 16 KB window. And you can see that we have very few errors in these reads. So these are 
uh, really nice to look at. And we also clearly can see all the SNPs that are both heterozygous and homozygous and phase these uh, in this large window. So with this information, we can now determine uh, the exact sequences where the guide RNAs will bind uh, in this genome. Uh, the experimental setup that we had for this project was to perform both this SMART uh, off-target sequencing and also the nanopore protocol using three different guide RNAs. So these are called ATXN10, MMP14, and NEC1. Uh, and many of these have been used before in other studies. Uh, we also developed an analysis method for uh, to automatically find the, the off-target binding sites. Uh, and this was done by first aligning the reads to a reference genome, and then in the second step, the, the places where, uh, where this Cas9 will cleave the molecules, it gives rise to a very specific pattern that looks like a peak like this, where we have uh, sharp uh, you know, cleavage of all these molecules. And we have developed a tool that can find this exact pattern in, in the aligned reads. Uh, and when we have these peaks, we go in and look at them and see what kind of sequence is in there. So we can assign each peak to a specific guide RNA, and then we can visualize the results. Uh, here you can see examples of peaks, both at the on-target sites uh, at the top. So you, we have the on-target sites for ATXN10, MMP14, and NEC1. And the red line here corresponds now to the Cas9 cleavage site. Uh, and at the bottom, you have examples of off-target sites uh, for, the, for ATX and 10 or MFP14 and NEC1. Uh, and you also have the aligned sequences for the guide RNA compared to the HIC-293 uh, genome. And you can see here that we get these peaks, uh, but although we have three mismatches for ATX and 10 and MFP14, and for the NEC1, we even have five mismatches, but still uh, see off-target binding. Uh, and if we summarize all the results uh, here, so these are the binding sites detected both by the smart sequencing and the nanopore protocol, uh, we find 55 of these uh, and we have, can visualize all the, the mismatches. So at the top of each, uh, the first line here in each of these panels is the on target and then we can see for the off targets, uh, these colored boxes shows uh, the mismatches that we have and we also in some cases we have insertions and deletions. So it seems like the guide RNA can bind to, to places in the genome where there are quite a lot of mismatches. Uh, so, and that could of course be a concern when doing these types of uh, editing experiments. Uh, another thing that was interesting is since we now have the, the, the reference genome for this cell line, uh, we can go and look at the HiFi data here at the bottom and we can see in this case we have a, a position where we have uh, two alleles when we look at the whole genome data but if we look at the, uh, the sequencing data for, from our off-target sequencing we, we only have one of the alleles so we only have the alternative haplotype reads uh, and this is consistent with allele specific Cas9 cleavage so actually the the alternative haplotype contains a SNP that makes uh, the guide RNA more similar to the alternative haplotype and the guide RNA will bind only there but not to the reference haplotype. Uh, and the conclusion of this is that uh, genetic variation can also affect uh, guide RNA, uh, at least in vitro, and that's important because uh, then, you know, as, as you know, people are different and maybe uh, some of these SNPs can give unexpected off-target sites. Uh, we also performed a de novo uh, assembly of this uh, HiFi data. So this was with help from Jason Chin. Uh, and in this case, the execution time was only one to two hours instead of several weeks as before. Uh, and this is because these HiFi reads are quite easy to assemble. And we also got a good, very good assembly statistics out of this. Uh, and what we did then was to, to use this de novo assembled reference instead of the existing human reference and did the same type of analysis using the, the smart o, OTS reads. And what we could see is that 98% of the Cas9 cleavage sites we could recover from the de novo assembly. So basically we find more or less all the off-targets uh, on and off-target sites 
by doing this analysis without having an, an, uh, an existing reference from before. Uh, yes. Uh, but so far I've been talking about experiments where we see uh, where the guide RNAs are binding to, to DNA, but we are really interested in what happens in living cells. Uh, so we have designed an experiment to try to study this, uh, where we first start from uh, fibroblast cells, and we perform this off-target sequencing for, for a specific guide RNA to find uh, where the, the guide RNA will bind, to detect all the off-targets, basically. Uh, <clears throat> what we then did was to perform uh, CRISPR-Cas9 editing using the same guide RNA in the same cells, uh, and this will give us uh, uh, some cells that are edited, so these are the green cells here, uh, and we also have a, a population of unedited cells. Uh, and what we then are doing is to use, take these edited cells, uh, and we, we uh, design long amplicons for all the on for the on target as well as for the off target sites uh, so in this case uh, the actual cas9 cleavage site will be in in the middle of these uh, of these regions and we want to see which types of mutations are occurring and we are performing this both on wild type cells and also on edited cells uh, and this is how it looks uh, when we are looking now at the mmp14 on target uh, and at the top here, we have edited fibroblasts. Uh, and this flash here in the middle, it, it corresponds to the Cas9 cleavage site. And what we can see is that we find a lot of small insertions and deletions uh, just close to this uh, to the Cas9 cleavage site. But then we also found some quite interesting things like this. This is a more than 500 base pair deletion occurring in this region. Uh, and we also found some insertions that are quite large, like this 328 base pair insertion uh, that is a perfect match uh, actually to the CRISPR-Cas9 vector used in the transfection. So it seems like this CRISPR vector has jumped into the, to the genome uh, at this uh, location when we're performing the editing. Uh, which is kind of interesting and perhaps it's not uh, what you really would would want when you do this type of experiments. Uh, so at the top we have here the, the edited fibroblast, but at the bottom we have the wild types and basically we don't see evidence of many uh, insertion or deletion uh, mutations here. So actually we, we clearly can see that we have uh, mut mutations in at this on target. But then we're also interested in the off targets and this is how it looks if we study look at one of the off targets uh, and surprisingly there's not much happening either in the edited fibroblasts or in the wild type so it doesn't seem that like we have uh, editing at the off target site uh, we have also quantified this uh, so to the left here we have the the on target you can see sort of the insertions and deletions are occurring uh, very closely to the cas9 cleavage site but at the off-target, uh, we don't see this pattern. So uh, basically, we haven't detected any off-target genome editing in our experiment. Uh, and this is perhaps a bit uh, surprising, or at least something that is uh, that we are thinking about. Uh, how come we find off-target, on-target mutations, but not off-target mutations in these fibroblast cells? Um, we are thinking that maybe it could have to do with the chromatin structure or the perhaps it could be the CRISPR-Cas9 method we're using so we use a transfection approach that is quite gentle maybe it's not really introducing a lot of off-target mutations uh, could there be some protective mechanism in these living cells uh, or should, could it be something with the DNA repair in these fibroblasts or, or something else uh, so what we are now doing is also to perform similar experiments also in uh, in cancer cell lines so coming back to the initial uh, sort of question here, how worried should we be? And I think this project has been like a bit of a roller coaster because we did find a lot of, uh, of targets using our methods uh, in our in vitro experiments. We see that the gu guide RNAs can bind despite having many mismatches. And we also see this large structural variance, these big deletions and insertions at, at the on-target sites in these edited fibroblasts. So uh, 
if we're thinking about these things, then uh, I would be kind of worried. Uh, but then when we're doing our uh, experiments on cells, we don't see any evidence of, of target editing in these living cells. So maybe uh, it's not that bad after all, but I think that we need to study this in more depth. Uh, so the conclusions that we have right now from this study is that uh, this smart uh, off-target sequencing protocol that we developed and also this hi-fi sequencing of the genome, uh, if we're using these methods we can get a very detailed map of cash 9 cleavage sites in our cells. We can find uh, allele-specific guide RNA binding uh, and we can also use these approaches to, to look at off-targets in uh, organisms that, that doesn't have a reference. But I think that we still need to learn about uh, how the off-target works in, in living cells, what is really going on there. Uh, and maybe there are many of you that are not working only in humans, uh, so what about looking at these off-targets in plants or other things? And I don't think there should be a big problem, because you can just first assemble your genome using hi-fi reads and then run these types of assays if you're interested to, to study these things. Yes, and with that, I uh, am almost done. Uh, I would just like to mention also, uh, because as all of you know, we are in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, I am a co-guest editor of a special issue in genes uh, with COVID-19 sequencing. So if you are developing new and interesting technologies for, for looking at this, this virus, then uh, you can consider to submit your work to this special issue. Uh, and with that, I would just like to finally thank the people who have been involved in all these uh, different projects, both at SciLife Lab, uh, support from PacBio, and also other collaborators. Uh, and thank all of you for listening as well, and I would be happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks a lot, Adam. That was a great talk. So now we're uh, getting into Q&A session. Uh, so if you have any questions or comments, please type into the question uh, dashboard. Okay, uh, let's have a look at the question dashboard. Okay, let's see. Okay, so this is actually quite an interesting uh, question. Um, this person is asking, uh, uh, can it be, so can it be used, uh, the technology can it be used for RNA sequencing? Uh, for example, uh, can you use it to replace RT-PCR for RNA virus detection purpose? So this is actually quite uh, <clears throat> trendy for the, uh, the COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. so can you make a comment on that? Yeah, uh, so that's something that we haven't. Uh, so, so I'm I'm thinking this question is now related to the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, right. approach, and yeah. that's something that we don't have any experience of ourselves to try to do this on on RNA. Um, so it might be something that's possible, but but that would be a completely new project, I think. And we, uh, I don't know how, how efficient. We can design these tools to target RNA molecules, but, but it certainly is interesting. So I have to, so, I have to pass on that one. Yeah, I, I can make a quick comment. It's, so in fact, uh, we actually have a bunch of protocols on our websites uh, where we sh uh, basically uh, illustrated how you can actually use this technology to sequence, uh, you know, coronavirus, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so if that's your interest, uh, please visit our website, uh, pacb.com. Um, and uh, you will find on the top of the landing page, there is a banner that basically guides you to that landing page where you find resources for that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, and of course, uh, maybe I can just comment again because uh, I'm thinking now, if you if you first make a cDNA molecule out of it and then use this approach, then it might be possible. But I think, I mean, you need to, to create a cDNA first. Right, of course. Okay. Uh,
thanks. Uh, next question. Um, so Dr. Uh, Adam Amir, I have a question on the CRISPR-Cas uh, Cas aided uh, no AMP targeted sequencing. Uh, since DNA input is a critical factor for the PEC bio sequencing, my question is how to achieve high depths with this targeted technique with a limited mm. amount of sample? That's a very good question. And I mean, in one way, it's, uh, it's not possible to go, I mean, since, since this is an amplification-free protocol now, we cannot get more reads for your target than the actual molecules that are present in the sample. Uh, and that is, of course, a limitation, but that's a limitation of the number of molecules that you have in the sample from the beginning. Uh, but then, of course, we can always try to make these, uh, these approaches more efficient in, in trying to sequence lower and lower amounts of inputs. And I think that we're now down to is it around one microgram or something for the CRISPR-Cas9 approach? Uh, and maybe that, that this could be reduced even further, but, but there is some kind of limitation also in the number of molecules that you have. Yeah, thanks. So uh, Adam, actually this reminds me of uh, some uh, similar studies. You, in fact, you, you, your team has got involved uh, where you guys use the uh, X-Drop technology yeah. from Sim Simplex, right? I think yes. in that case, uh, the the input material could be actually much lower. That, that was really yes, impressive. that's a good point. And I did not present the, that work in this presentation. I didn't have really time to go into that, but but we have been doing that. But but that's an amplification based method. But there we are isolating the long DNA fragments in droplets and then uh, sort out the positive droplets or the droplets containing the target of interest uh, using a fax instrument. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but then we need to do amplification afterwards uh, yeah. to to get sufficient amount of material for sequencing. Uh, but that could be uh, one way to to act, reduce the input amount quite a lot. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Uh, yeah, there was a question raised about that you know particular worm study that uh, you yeah. showed. Very interesting. So. Uh, this person is asking uh, whether it's possible that uh, warm DNA actually got integrated into the human genome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that quite a lot as well, but uh, but it doesn't. I mean, it's difficult to prove anything, right? Uh, because that could have happened as well, I, I suppose. But but I think this is a more logical explanation uh, that we have in in the original worm studies that we have contamination of human DNA because when you think about it it, it must be quite kind of difficult to isolate uh, this worm DNA without having any of the host DNA present and then since these these regions are missing from the human reference that you're comparing to I think I think that's a more logical explanation but of course we cannot rule anything out by 100 percent mm -hmm. yeah thank you uh, Here's another question that's quite interesting. Uh, um, he wanted to actually understand, I mean, I learn from you in terms of your experience uh, between the uh, SQL2 and then Oxford Nanopore technology. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your experience you know, between SQL2 and ONT? Would you suggest one instrument over the other based on different applications? That's a very good question as well. And that's something that we're continuously trying to evaluate. So we also, have the Promethean system uh, from Oxford Nanopore uh, to compare with. Um, and I mean, and all, things always change because uh, there comes new versions of uh, different chemistries or different softwares that makes things change all the time. Um, but if you want, I mean, the, the strength with the PEC bio sequencer is that we can get these uh, hi fi reads from SQL 2. Uh, and that is, I think, really valuable for, for many applications. So, for example, when doing assembly, I mean, it's, it's really good to have these uh, high quality reads. Uh, and that's something that you cannot really get from the nanopore. So we are doing most of our assembly work and also other studies are now done on SQL 2. But uh, I think the nanopore has the advantage uh, of having these super long reads. So in some cases you might want to also have these like 
reads of 100 kVs or more, um, that's not really possible to get on the PacBio. So if you want really super long reads, then, then it would be Oxford Nanopore. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, the next question um, also asked about the uh, smart uh, OTS method. What is the optimized depth for proper detection uh, for as low as 0.1% off target um, event in the bulk living cell, for example, uh, 10, to the, uh, 10 to the 6 cells? Yeah, so that's also a very good question. And we, at, at this point, we cannot study uh, very low frequency mutations. So we have, I mean, we're getting a read depth of about a few thousand X. So maybe we can study mutations down to 1% or something like that. But um, but if we would like to go even lower, then I think we would need to introduce uh, these UMI tags or something to, to have some molecular tags and, and do special things to look at these very uh, mutations that are occurring in very low frequency. And that is not something that we have done yet. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, next question is also asking about the, uh, I guess, the difference between the, uh, the Impact bio and ONT in this regard. Uh, how does the CRISPR-Cas9 approach uh, impact bio differ compared to the uh, that of the ONT? Is the SNP accuracy of impact bio higher? Mm. Yeah. Uh, so if, if we want to look at SNPs and things like that, then I would uh, prefer to use the PAC bio approach because we get uh, higher quality reads. Um, for other things. It doesn't really matter because then we, I mean, if we just want to find uh, the off-target sites, then I think both methods are doing quite a good job on, on detecting those. Right. Okay, great. Um, the next question uh, is asking about your impression of, you know, um, smart sequencing in, in this area, of, you know, general area of cancer genetics. What's your experience? Because you have been, you know, involved in some of these uh, cancer related mm -hmm. projects right yeah yeah so i think there's a lot of opportunity for for using this technology in cancer genetics it's not used that much yet but i think uh, it has the advantage uh, of being able to phase molecules over quite long distance and to see if mutations are existing in the same clones or not so that's something that we are doing uh, in this uh, BCR able mutation screening. We're not only detecting low frequency mutations, but we can also uh, identify for, for each patient which different clones that uh, is present in that patient. So if you need, I mean, in the cases where you need this long range information and want to look at somatic events, then I think smart sequencing is really great. Uh, and then I think there's a lot of opportunity also in whole genome sequencing. Um, with, with these long reads and hi-fi reads, uh, because it should be possible to find a lot of complex rearrangements and things like that. But that's not something that we have been looking into, but I know that other groups have been doing great uh, studies in, in using smart sequencing for for cancer uh, samples as well. So, but, but I think that's something that is quite new and, uh, but has a lot of promise. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, there's a question about your uh, Swedish genome. Uh, how many contexts are added uh, in a Swedish uh, uh, specific genome? What is the total base pairs for those contexts? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if I have the numbers right on top of my head, but I think it's around 10 megabases or even more, 20 perhaps. Um, and we, I, maybe I should be a bit careful as well because I, I don't think that all of this is novel sequence. So some of it could be like completely new sequence, but a lot of it is could also be sequence that is like alternative haplotypes that is just kind of different compared to the to the existing human reference. Uh, so what we have been doing is just to take all these sequences that didn't align to the human reference and just add it. Uh, but we haven't really tried to to curate the reference and sort of create a new Swedish uh, complete human reference because 
uh, I don't really know how to do that in this point in time. And maybe we should, one thing that we're thinking about if we, is if we should instead try to use like graph-based uh, approaches to, to build new pan references. But I know that there's a lot of ongoing work. Also, there's a whole consortium working on, on that kind of thing as well. So maybe the way to go is to instead try to uh, add our data to some uh, some uh, human pan reference at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, the next question is about the um, uh, the the guide RNA again. So can can the guide RNA de de detect SNPs in particular to the non-repetitive nucleotide level? Mm, okay. Do I understand? No, I don't really understand, but but I can say something about uh, something that is perhaps related. Uh, if we're talking about repetitive regions, and we actually designed now guide RNAs also to target uh, regions of the genome that is known to be dark, sort of, or regions where we don't have coverage in uh, in short read data that is more repetitive, and actually we can see. Uh, that we find coverage also in those regions. So it could be a way to try to target also more uh, repetitive regions of the genome using this type of approach. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, next question is quite interesting. It's, I guess it's rather a philosophical question, not a scientific one. So how, how do you know the novel sequences you're detecting in the Swedish are actually specific to Swedish? Are there uh, yeah. similar studies available from other populations? Yes, I mean, there, there have been a few studies now from other populations, and they have also found a lot of novel sequence. So I don't think that this sequence is specific for the Swedish population. I rather think that it's, it's a lot of sequences that that are just difficult to, to read, uh, and they haven't been sequenced before. And I think when we are sequencing more and more human genomes with with these long read technologies, we will rediscover the same sequences. So I think a lot of it is uh, is common between all individuals. But then perhaps there is a small portion that is specific for the population, but we don't know how big that proportion is yet. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is about uh, off target again okay uh, obviously off target can be visualized using smart uh, OTS or nano OTS but uh, is there a particular database to, to perform mm. on? no uh, not that I know of um, but maybe I mean that would be of course interesting if, if you could start to screen um, many guide RNAs and perhaps in many different cells and create some kind of database with known on and off targets uh, so people don't have to do these experiments over and over again. Uh, but I don't think there is, not that I'm aware at least, there, there's not a database. Okay. Um... Yeah, the next question, uh, I'm not quite sure if you can address or not, because it's asking about the to quantify the percentage of the haplotype SNPs that you have found in, in your Keck cell line. Keck cell line. Uh, I'm not sure you found any haplotype SNPs. So we haven't analyzed this Hex cell line that that much uh, we have I mean we have done assembly of it as well and we have a lot of data and I think that using this data we could try to figure out which kind of if, if there are any haplotype differences and so on but but it's not something that we have been been doing so far but maybe it would be interesting okay um... The next one, I guess, uh, let's talk about the software. So any, any software is available for the off-target analysis? Uh, yeah, so we have sort of built our own tool for this. Uh, it's called Insider. It's available from GitHub. Uh, basically, what that tool does is to take aligned 
reads, and then it finds these types of patterns as I described before. Um, so that can take you quite far, as, at least to get the coordinates where, where the guide RNAs are binding. And then what you need to do is to, to perhaps look a bit closer into the sequences in these peaks and try to assign it to a guide RNA. And we have some way of doing it, but it's not really an open tool. Uh, and I can say also that uh, the actual alignment for that one, we're using Minimap2. So that's also an open tool. Mm, OK. Uh, OK. Uh, next question. Let's see. How do you uh, reduce the duplication read rate uh, when my DNA samples are limited? I... DNA duplication rate. I mean, that's... Um, okay, so, so this is assuming that you are that you are performing a PCR, I suppose, because that's all, the only way that you can get uh, yeah. duplicates from the same molecule. Uh, and I guess the best way to reduce the duplicate rate is to use some molecular tag uh, to put some kind of UMI, a unique molecule, to each DNA molecule before doing the amplification and then try to keep track on that. Um, so that's that would be one way to do it, but, but we haven't done it yet in our studies, but it would be great if there are, were some easy ways to do to add UMI tags during, during amplification. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next question about uh, coming back to the uh, off-target study again. Uh, can we use this the technology to identify off-target effects of our test drugs on animals? Mm, yeah, I suppose. I mean, as long as you have, uh, if you're interested, I mean, if your drug is, is some kind of uh, CRISPR therapy, uh, you can for sure try to see where this, this guide RNA or sort of the, the different guide RNAs you're using where they are binding in the genome and what type of, of targets they produce. But then I think, I mean, you need to, to study these particular sites in more detail uh, in the living animals and see if they actually have mutations there. Because as I mentioned, it, it doesn't always happen that sort of just because a uh, guide RNA is binding to, to a place in the genome, it doesn't necessarily have to lead to, to off-target mutations. Yeah, thank you. So uh, coming back to the uh, Swedish genome and again, uh, so your work clearly shows some uh, large amount of uh, missing sequences, and uh, this is uh, from just two genomes. Possibly there is also rare alleles in the current reference as well. Uh, now that there are many high quality genomes from humans with, with many different ethnic backgrounds, what is the process to update the human reference? Uh, it mm. seems we're actually using a very outdated version. Yeah, that's a great question, and it's like <laughs> something I've been thinking about a lot. And I know that also the Human Genome Reference Consortium are thinking about it a lot. And as as I know, I mean, they were planning before to to release a new version of the human genome a while ago, but then they decided instead uh, to focus on building a graph genome to try to take into account all this diversity. Uh, that's mentioned in this question. So I think the next version of the genome will be some kind of a pan-human genome from different ethnic groups. So it will be something that is perhaps quite different to to the thing that we're used to working with now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a question on the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 again. Can Cas9 guide RNA recognize SNPs? Uh, what is the sensitivity of Cas9 slash guide RNA? Yeah, I mean it's that's a good question, and and we now have one example, as, as I showed at least, where where we can see that the guide RNA is binding uh, to one allele but not to the other one, and it's because of one single SNP in the guide RNA binding sequence. So it seems like a guide RNA can recognize a SNP. But we don't know how common this is because we all only have one single example yet. Um, but it seems like it's it's possible, yes. 
Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna scroll down, uh, see if we can hit any questions of uh, a broader interest. Uh, okay, so uh, in your experience with PEPAR HiFi uh, human whole genome sequencing, what is the minimal coverage needed? And what QV it can achieve with that coverage? <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, we still have kind, kind of limited experience, but uh, but we usually aim to to get around 15x coverage uh, of uh, hi-fi data and molecules that are perhaps uh, 15 to 20 kbs in length. Uh, and with that data, we can assemble really high quality genomes. Uh, of course, I mean, it could improve if we have even more coverage, but I think that's a relatively low improvement. So maybe it's more efficient than to use other technologies for scaffolding and so on. Um, but I think around 15x coverage, and for human genomes, that would that it required us two uh, hi-fi smart cells to to generate the data for for the HEC 293. So that that was enough, at least in that case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, here's a, uh, uh, a very provocative question uh, in my mind. Uh, so this person is asking about, you know, comparing in the context of a Sanger sequencing, right? So is smart sequencing maybe in a more expensive alternative compared to Sanger sequencing? Uh, mm -hmm. Can smart sequence uh, actually show mutations in coding or non-coding part of the gene? Yeah, that's a good question as well. And I mean, Sanger sequencing is, is of course, it, it could be a cheap way to, to look at, uh, at regions, but, but in some cases, I mean, in some cases, I think Sanger is still fine, uh, but in other cases, uh, like for example, the VCR ABLE project that we're doing, uh, they actually analyzed this region with Sanger sequencing before, but they could only find mutations down to 20% because it's a very like manual approach to look at these kind of chromatograms. Uh, but with the smart sequencing, we can easily go down to 1%. And uh, since we can do multiplexing of many samples on one smart cell, uh, I think the cost of doing the smart sequencing is actually lower compared to, to Sanger sequencing. Um, so, and I think, I mean, we are moving in the direction where most things that are done using Sanger could be done with these technologies that are perhaps more accurate. So, um, I mean, Sanger sequencing can still be around for some time, but, but eventually I think it will be replaced. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, let me see what questions we have. We have a lot of questions. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You are so popular. Uh, so how can you be sure that MMNP9 has no off target in the HEC uh, 293 cell line? Uh, it does have off. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. In, in the cells. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah that, that's a good question and i mean we haven't really i mean but but what we're seeing is that there's a clear difference between the on target sites where we clearly can see the differences and the, the mutations uh, but that the off targets if they exist uh, off target mutations it's very low uh, so at least it's not as many off targets or mutations in the mmp14 um, but we cannot be completely sure. And I think also one thing that is important here is that we are using this uh, very gentle approach to perform the editing. Uh, as I've understood, if you use other methods, then you can get much more on-target editing, perhaps 80%. In our case, we have perhaps six or 7% edited molecules. Uh, and if you have this very efficient on-target editing, I think there's also a higher risk that you will see off target mutations so i mean this experiment is not complete in that sense and i think we need to look uh, more closely into that mm -hmm. yeah so uh in your experiments of the guide rna uh exercise did you actually use only the guide rna control uh, if yes then uh, did you find any nucleotide changes compared to the reference Oh, I'm not sure I followed 
that one. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Uh... All right, I think uh, in the interest of time, we will probably uh, stop here because we're already uh, 15 minutes past an hour. So for those of you uh, who, whose question didn't get answered, we will uh, make sure we uh, get back to you uh, with email. And uh, so with that, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that today's uh, talk has been recorded and then we will make that available to you as well as the uh, PDF version of the presentation. Uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, have everybody and uh, I would like to thank Adam for your excellent presentation and your patience and going through all the questions. Yes, and uh, thank you. Yeah, with that, I would like to thank all the attendees and have a lovely day ahead. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.